How you doing, Kenny? Hood Rubino, Devil's Digest. I know that with all the buzz that this game created, and for good reason, um, people are going to ask, how is ASU going to handle now success? How is ASU going to handle the buzz? I thought you made really interesting comments about the uh, near three-hour delay and how the team handled itself in the locker room. Is that maybe in a way kind of an indication how the team is going to handle this game this Saturday from a mental standpoint? I hope, because we played really well after the break. Uh, no, I mean, we had, you know, we, our guys are, they like football. So, I mean, I think it was good for them to figure out how to win on the road. I think that was, I think that was bothering them that we played poorly on the road. And then kudos to our opponents on the road. I mean, I think we two of the teams we lost to are two of the top five teams right now are in the Big 12. And we played them at their place. Um, our first up road game and then a road game without Sam, which is a challenge. Uh, so I think, you know, we also faced some difficult situations in there. And uh, I think our guys were ready to try to respond to that, to that challenge. And this will be a great challenge this week. You know, Coach Malzahn's won a ton of games in his career. He made two coordinator changes. One of the guys I worked with, Addison Williams, who's phenomenal. And uh, I, I, don't, I, I haven't worked with the other coordinators, only his brother, Brandon Harris. And, uh, like, those guys played really hard for those two guys. And it was, it was noticeable that that was a different football team last Saturday. So I'm excited to see our guys just get back to work. Chris Cartman, son of a source. Uh, Kenny wanted to talk about uh, Cam Scadaboo, the fourth offensive player of the week in the Big 12. Nobody else has won it more than once. Last year, Ollie Gordon won it four times. He was Dope Walker Award winner and Big 12 Offensive Player of the Week. Um, can you just put into perspective what this has been like from your perspective, especially the evolution from last year, what he's meant to the team? And then a lot of people have asked, like, um, you know, how healthy he is coming off of that, that game, so that part too. Yeah, uh, well, one, uh, well, I've said it multiple times, he's completely changed his work ethic, uh, his mindset. You know, he's always had that dog on game day, that competitiveness on game day. Uh, but he's just the, the process that he, go, that he went through this offseason to get into the shape he's been in. Uh, like I said, we've had some fun conversations. We've had some not, not fun conversations. But it's out of respect for each other. And uh, he's grown, and he's the best version of himself right now. Uh, you know, he's actually doubtful to questionable for the game this week. Uh, so we'll see how that how that transpires. You know, he's not going to practice this week. And uh, like I said, he's, he's doubtful this week. You know, he went out at the end of the game there, um, undisclosed injury. But, uh, you know, whether he plays or not plays in the football game, he's going to make an impact on our football team because he's one of the leaders of the team. And can I just follow up? Um, an example like the one that he sets, how much value is that um, for your team? Yeah, I mean, it's when you have guys who just play really hard and physical, uh, I think everybody has to match that. And I think the way he's playing hard, the way he's playing physical, the way he's, he's been practicing up to this point, uh, people emulate what your best players, you know, allow to happen on the practice field. And uh, he's just done such a phenomenal job setting his own standard for himself uh, to be a way better player than he was last year. Because, to be honest, he's uh, unrecognizable in my eyes from this year to last year. I mean, two or three of those big plays this last game, he may not have scored on uh, last year. This version does because he has an extra gear because he put in the work to get his body in the best shape of his life. And, uh, you know, we're going to do whatever is in the best interest of him and, and um, do whatever we can to get him healthy and uh, get him back as soon as possible. Jordan, then Jake. Hey, Kenny. Uh, Jordan Ham, Sports 360 AZ. Uh, with Cam being doubtful, if he's not able to go, how would you assess how – Kyson was able to run the ball on Saturday and seen a, an expanded role potentially along with the rest of that backfield. Yeah, obviously other guys would have to sp step up for sure. I thought uh, Sip, Kyson, uh, for those of you who don't know, he, uh, he did a phenomenal job breaking tackles uh, on the first touchdown run. I mean, he broke a defensive tackles tackle, then ran through another tackle. Uh, he ran like a bigger back, which is what I was most pleased with in the game, the most touches he's gotten in the game, the most workload he's gotten, and he stayed fresh throughout it. Uh, he's extremely hard on himself, which is, you know, what you want to see. You know, he was the only guy who wasn't celebrating after the game because he let the ball go for a quarter of a second on the one goal line play, and he was just so mad at himself for doing that. 
And that's what you want your football team to be filled with. You want to be filled with those guys that, yeah, you had success. But, man, that one time that it wasn't perfect, it just drives me insane. And he kind of had that to him. I'm like, smile, bud. It's okay. We just won the game. Like, you just had the two touchdowns. And he just can't get that one play out of his mind. But that's why he's where he's at. And uh, I'm excited for him. And obviously some other guys will have to step up as well, uh, you know, if, if Scott can't go. Kenny, Jake Garcia with 12 News back here. Um, one more question on Cam. I saw the, uh, the graphics department here already made a Cam for Heisman uh, graphic and tweeted that out. I'm curious if you could make your pitch as to why he's deserving for uh, consideration. And I guess we'll find out this week, but um, just the level of impact that, that he has on the team and what he means to this program. Yeah, well, I think, one, He's been a big part of a huge change in a program. And when you talk about most valuable player, right, whether I don't know exactly what the prerequisites are for that award, you know, just because it's over time, these awards kind of change to quarterback awards and stuff like that. But if you're talking about a guy who's impactful on a team, this is a guy who's you know, arguably the most impactful person on a, on a team that was three wins last year who tra helped transform a team, not just on the field with the play, but the mindset like we talked about earlier, the work ethic, the physicality, the toughness. He transformed an organization, helped transform an organization. And uh, I think that's powerful. I think, uh, I think it's really hard to put that into a statistical category. I think everybody's going to look at the stats that he puts up, but they don't look at him sprinting down the field on kickoff. They don't look at him sprinting on the screen pass to Melquan Stovall and being the guy in front of Melquan Stovall after he faked zone to the field and being the first guy in front. All of those things add to him being the value to the football team, not just the stats. It's all the other stuff too. And I say you combine the stats with the mindset of our football team and, and he's one of the people that we take the mindset after. And uh, then you combine that with how far, this program, how far the program has come and I think all that should add to his uh, resume, some would say. That rhymed. That was pretty good. Hey, Coach. Justin Lester, Toes of Devil's Digest. The term next man up kind of gets thrown around a lot within sports, but last week it was LT Welch against Utah. It was Caleb McCullough. So for you and specifically Coach Ward and that defensive unit, what are some of the things that you guys have done to implement that buy-in where, hey, your number might not be called right away, but when it is, got to be ready to compete? Honestly, nothing. Uh, I wish we preached on that. Just be your very best all the time. Whether you're the starter, whether you're the second string, whether you're the third string, every day you wake up, you choose to be miserable, you choose to be happy for the most part, right? You choose to work hard, you choose to be lazy. You choose to get better, you choose to not. Just do all the good things of what I just said over and over again. And if you do that, then when your time comes, you're going to be ready for your opportunity. And if you don't, uh, then you won't. And it's, it's pretty simple. It's whether you're the starter or the fourth string guy, just be the very best version of yourself every single day and repeat and repeat and repeat. Hey, Coach. Jake Sloan, Devils Digest. We saw Javon Robinson come up with an interception, and then the two games prior, Keith Abney, two picks of his own. How does, how does those guys performing from sideline to sideline kind of build the trust of the whole defense? Yeah, obviously we've played a little bit more man coverage the last few games uh, than we had in weeks prior. You know, I don't know if that trend's going to continue this week. You know, it just that's been based off who we've played. Uh, so this week a little bit different. Um, you know, changing of a quarterback and what they do offensively. So we don't know if that trend will continue. But those guys have just stepped up and they're really smart guys. I mean, those guys are both of those kids you just mentioned are two of the smartest football savvy players in our football team. And it's amazing how successful people can be when you're smart and you understand splits and you understand routes and you understand when guys lower their pad level. Like all the fundamentals that go into the game that you would think like are normal for people to understand, very few people can actually take that to the field and apply it. You know, you can talk about it in a meeting room, but then being able to apply it when teams playing fast or at tempo is kudos to those guys. And uh, they're both really good players. Glad we have them. Kenny, what, um, what are some of the most important lessons you learned from Gus Malzahn in your time with him? Yeah, I think the number one is the leadership council. 
Uh, I really thought the leadership council when we were at Auburn together, or I guess when I was at Auburn with him, right? He was the head coach. Uh, when I was at Auburn with him, uh, was I really felt like every time he left that leadership council meeting, uh, he had a much better beat on the football team. You know, sometimes when you're a head coach, you can kind of lose lose a beat on your team at times. And uh, I thought that council did a really good job for him at the time saying, hey, our guys are beat up. We need to slow it down a little bit. Or, hey, this kid needs to be loved up. Hey, you can't yell at this guy or get on this guy again like he's going through some things. I just think that council was so big, and I'd never – uh, you know, it may have been done in my past when I was a GA, but uh, once I got to a point where I could really be on the inner conversations of how things worked, I'd never been on a staff that did that. And uh, I thought it was really, really good, and it's something that I knew I always wanted to do. So I would say that's the number one thing I took away was the ability to have a, a beat on your team uh, by having a leadership council who can really set your standard and really be your voice uh, and really get a shared vision of what you want it to look like. Hey, Kenny, Tucker Center, Cronkite News. Um, just kind of piggybacking off of that last question, you're obviously, you worked under Gus at, at Auburn and stuff. How does that change your preparation for this week at all, if, if at all? Well, I mean, it doesn't really. I mean, everybody knows Gus is going to run inside zone. I mean, that's not a secret. Like, that's what they do, and he probably does it better, arguably, than anybody in the country. And, uh, and I was around him coaching it, him teaching it. That's what they believe in. And I think that's what's made him successful is, of course, other people are going to come in and give him ideas. Oh, we need to run outside zone. Oh, we need to do this. We need to do that. All these ideas. And it was just awesome listening to him say, no, this is what we do. We're going to – I don't care what you do. It's going to work because our guys know where to fit the run. If, you, if your front side end the zone and plays too tight, the ball's going to bounce. Most tight zone teams don't do that. Most tight zone teams have a backside track. His tight zone does not. It can hit anywhere, and that's unique. And I think so. One thing I learned from him is, you know, have an identity for what you want and buy into that. And that's something that he's done his entire career. That's something that I'm trying to create here. It may not be the same identity, but that mindset of people are going to know who we are, I think there's some power to that. And I think that's why he's been so successful um, on offense for so long. Hey, Kenny, Jake Seamers, Thunderbolt Source. Uh, L.C. Welch had a very strong performance Saturday. Um, what does his kind of overall performance do for that group um, and, for, and for the team and the defense looking forward? Yeah, L.T. is one of our energy guys. So anytime one of your energy guys plays really well, you know, and gets that opportunity and has success, people feed off of it. Uh, so it was great from that perspective. Then it just showed, like, the work, the work, the work. Like, he hasn't complained one time uh, this year, not once. He had some injuries early, came back, lost his spot, been battling back. Our corners have been playing well. He started to get back in the rotation, got his opportunity, played really well. Like, what else could you want? Especially for a guy that brings great energy. And uh, he's brought it every single day. That's why I gave him a game ball. He looked at his Instagram he posted the game ball, you know, it was, it was cool. It was awesome to see uh, a guy like that really, you know, just embrace his moment and uh, make the best of it. Damon Allred, Damon Arizona Sports. With Parker Lewis hitting all six extra points and the field goal attempt looking like it would be good from much further if it was online, is he going to continue to kick for you? Yes. Kenny, when a uh, team has as many changes in terms of play calling and coordinators and, and everything that goes with it on the other side, how hard is that to now evaluate what they may be doing on Saturday? Very. <laughs> Very. I mean, especially when they play a game where the game's basically over at halftime uh, uh, and it's like, okay, well, what were they trying to actually do in the game? You don't know because they only played really a half of football uh, from that perspective. So uh, very difficult. You're kind of going in blind to any rhythm of a play caller on both sides of the ball. You don't have a rhythm uh, for either of the guys. You hope that they keep some trends the same. You hope that uh, they don't come out and have their own flair or you have to be ready for their own flair and you have to dig back into their history and say, okay, if this guy is going to go outside of, you know, maybe the comfort zone of the last coordinator, the last play caller, uh, what were his go-tos that he would be the first thing he'd put in. So you got to do a little bit of digging 
into the history. Um, and I alluded to it earlier, you know, um, Addison Williams, I worked with at Auburn with Gus. He actually worked on the offensive side of the ball. Uh, he was actually, me and him worked hand in hand. We were partners in crime over there all the time together. Uh, so he's been in the quarterback room before. He's been in my quarterback room before. We've been in it together. We worked on game plans together. I mean, we were very close. And uh, now he's on the defensive side of the ball, right? And then we have Coach Gibbs, who was on their defensive staff, who's now on the offensive side of the ball. So it's kind of funny that, you know, I kind of took that model from Gus, another thing that you had of having a defensive guy on that offensive side of the ball, which is a trend in, in the NFL now anyways. But uh, so I'm excited. Addison's a phenomenal football coach. I, I, I firmly believe that. I think he's a head coach in the making over there. Uh, he's phenomenal. His family's awesome. He's a great person. He's a really good coach. He's super intelligent. Like, he's going to have some things for us that we got to be ready for. Doug Franz, Doug Franz Unplugged Podcast. Um, go back to your leadership council for a second. Number one, other than they're good leaders, what what made you choose the people that you chose? And uh, and then number two, can you tell us a story about the 2024 season where the leadership council said, this is more of the direction and you followed? Uh, yeah, well, first part of the question, I didn't choose anybody. It's 100% uh, player picked. Uh you know, some people don't like that model because they say, well, you're going to get somebody who's just popular on the council. And uh, my rebuttal is, well, if he's popular, he has a voice. Don't we want that guy believing in the vision, right? You, you don't just want the teacher's pets being the leaders of your football team because they're only going to – only certain guys are going to respond to those guys. You've got to get a football team and a vote of your team of who they want to lead them and let those guys lead them. I can't pick who's going to lead a team. So uh, not everybody agrees with that, uh, but that's just my, my belief. And for us, it's really <laughs> practices. Like, how do your bodies feel? Coach, we're, we're tired. We're not going to lie. All right, we need to slow it down then. Like, we got to take it back. And uh, so I don't know if there's really one specific moment. I do know one specific moment, but I'm not going to get into that. It was about a, a different scenario. But where they said, give us a chance to, to you know, save this player who maybe did some made some poor decisions, you know, off not off the field, but like in the classroom and showing up on time, and uh, we set a standard and we hold it. And they said, you know what, give us a chance, like let let us handle this. We got it, no issue since. Uh, so for me, this is their football team. Like we're only going to be as good as they play. We're only going to play as hard as they play. We're only going to be as fundamentally sound as they play, because everybody's looking at them. We're only going to show up early if they show up early. So it's like, it's not about me, it's not about the staff, it's about how do we get the, this group of people to set a standard high enough. And I think this group, what's unique is they want it. And uh, we have a group of people, I think, that are setting a high, higher standard uh, than what we've had in the past. Uh, Kenny, how much um, will this positive <laughs> momentum with your record uh, help with uh, roster retention and in recruiting? Yeah, I mean, roster retention, I'll be honest, good and bad. The more you win, the more people want your players, the more money they're going to pay them. So we need to fundraise more money. That's just the nature of the beast. The more you lose, the less people want your players, <laughs> the less they're going to play them. Like, <laughs> that's how it's the nature of the beast. So every time we win, just understand, we need to raise more money to be able to retain our players after the season ends. I will say, I think our players want to be here. I think if our players had their pick on where they where they want to be, I think this is where they want to be. You know, I asked our leadership council last week, who's kind of thinking about, you know, what happens in four weeks? They're like, not many people. Like, we're all about right now. And I think that's what makes this group exciting and awesome is they want to be here. But at the same token, this is still somewhat of a business from their perspective. And the more you win, the more people are going to come calling them and the higher the price point's going to be. And us as a fan base, us as – Arizona State, the university, we, they all, everybody has to step up to be ready to, you know, to be ready to push the chips in come December. Are you glad that this would be the last off season of this before the, the house settlement and the schools compensating athletes uh, changes the, the, the model? Yeah, I think that's the exciting part is, you know, I've been telling people, at least our donors for a long time, that NIL is not a marathon, it's a race. And it's a race. This is an 18-month, that's what I said last year, and now it's coming to fruition. I kind of got lucky, right? But 
It's what I believed. It's an 18 month race. And we're in the last hundred of this 400. Like we're right there. And if we can retain our roster, just retain our roster. And I think the guys want to be here. They want to be Sun Devils. They're happy here. They're proud to be here. They're, they take some pride in doing what they've done and getting this place back in the right direction, not where we want to be yet, but getting the right direction. If we as an alumni, a fan base, an institution can back that and support that, I think we can retain the roster through when this new court case closes. And then I think we'll be able to, uh, you know, compete with anybody in the country when we get to that point. Uh, but it is a challenge for the next f four months. And uh, we got to find a way to get these guys where they should be, in my opinion, fairly, what they deserve. And, uh, and that's really what I'm going to be focused on here on Thursday nights, Wednesday nights, and this off season uh, early is how do we make sure we retain our roster because people want players who win. Coach, with the obviously with the delay, I know you dealt with it last year, but having the obviously having the tablets and everything, although both teams have to go through it, how much do you feel that that, that helped and just everybody being able to look at plays and I guess make the delay go by a little bit faster? Yeah, it was awesome. I mean, it was, but it's both sides of the ball, both, both teams. Uh, you know, I think it really just came down to the water burger we ate. You know, <laughs> every water burger will give somebody an NIL deal. Uh, but, uh, too bad we didn't have Sam's Wraps in uh, Oklahoma City. We could have bought some Sam's Wraps from cold beer and cheeseburgers, but that was too far away to get ordered for the halftime. But maybe next rain delay we can get some of that ordered. Thank you. Have a great day.